Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the horrific murders which occurred in Amityville, Long Island in 1974. This true crime became the basis for many films, initially the 1979 release, The Amityville Horror, which claims to be based on true events that took place in the years following these murders. In 1951, 21-year-old Ronald DeFeo and 20-year-old Louise Marie Bigant were married. Their first child, Ronald Jr., was born later that year and when Ronald was five years old, his sister Dawn was born. Three more children followed. Alison, who was born in 1961, Mark, born in 1962, and the family was complete after the birth of their fifth child, John, in 1965. That same year, the family moved into a large three-story house at the now infamous address of 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, Long Island. The house had six bedrooms, a heated pool and a large boathouse on the Amityville River. Ronald Sr. worked with his father-in-law at their Buick dealership in Brooklyn. He earned a good wage and provided an extremely comfortable lifestyle for his family. From outside appearances, it would appear that the family had an idyllic life. However, Ronald Sr. was a controlling man with a violent temper. Explosive arguments would often occur between Ronald Sr. and Louise, and their eldest son, Ronald Jr., would often be on the receiving end of his father's temper. In addition to the problems he was suffering from at home, Ronald Jr. was unpopular at school and was often the subject of relentless bullying by his peers. As he became older and stronger, the fights between him and his father became more physical. Ronald Jr. became increasingly violent in other areas of his life and was referred to a psychiatrist to help him to manage his temper. However, when this failed to address his problems, his parents resorted to large bribes in an attempt to get Ronald to behave better. These bribes only made the situation worse. Ronald became increasingly entitled and his behaviour deteriorated. By the age of 17, he had been expelled from school due to his violent outbursts and had started using illegal drugs. In a further attempt to bring some stability to his life, Ronald was given a position at his family's Buick dealership, but despite receiving a decent weekly salary, his attendance was patchy and his work ethic lacking. Ronald's behaviour continued to worsen and his violence, particularly towards his father, escalated. Ronald Jr. felt that he was worth far more than what he considered to be the small salary which he was receiving. He began stealing from the car dealership, and when his father confronted him about this, Ronald threatened to kill his father. On November 13th, 1974, Ronald left for work in the morning as per usual. When he arrived at the car dealership, but his father didn't, he called home, but no one answered the telephone. Ronald informed his colleagues that he did not know why his father hadn't come into work that day. After work, he visited some friends and mentioned to them that he was unable to reach his family. When he returned home at around 6.30pm that evening, he found that his house had been broken into and his entire family had been shot. 23-year-old Ronald rushed to nearby Henry's Bar in Amityville shouting for help. A small group accompanied Ronald back to the house where they found Ronald's parents and siblings dead inside. One of the group, Joe Yeswill, called the Suffolk County Police Department to report what had happened. When the police arrived, they found all six members of Ronald's family had been shot. Ronald told the detectives that he thought that the murders had been carried out by a mafia hitman. The name of this man was Louis Fellini, with whom there had been a dispute at the car dealership. Ronald was taken into custody for his own safety. The police found that all the six victims had been shot with a 35 caliber rifle. It was a Marlin 336C. Ronald Sr. and his wife Louise had both been shot twice, whilst 18-year-old Dawn, 13-year-old Allison, 12-year-old Mark and 9-year-old John had all been shot once. 
All six of the bodies were in identical positions, lying face down in their own beds. It was estimated that they had all died within around 15 minutes of each other and that both Louise and Alison had been awake at the time of their deaths. The police became suspicious of Ronald almost immediately. It was soon established that the murders had taken place very early in the morning when Ronald would have been at the house. At this point he changed his story to state that Louis Fellini had arrived with an accomplice and had put a gun to Ronald's head and made him watch his entire family being murdered. Again this version of events did not add up, particularly as Ronald had calmly spent the day at work and then with friends whilst telling everyone he was unable to make contact with his family. Less than 24 hours after the murders, Ronald confessed to the crimes, stating that Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Just under a year later, Ronald went on trial for the murder of his parents and four siblings. His defence attorney, William Webber, entered an insanity plea. During the trial, Ronald behaved very strangely, frequently changing details of his story and even threatening to kill both the judge and his own lawyer. He confessed to the murders, claiming that voices made him do it. The psychiatrist for the defence supported this and testified that Ronald had a disassociative disorder which meant that he would experience the event from outside of his body, i.e. watching it rather than experiencing it. However, the prosecution psychiatrist dismissed this claim, stating that Ronald suffered from antisocial personality disorder and as such would be perfectly aware of what he was doing and would fully understand the difference between right and wrong. On the 21st of November 1975, Ronald was found guilty of six counts of second degree murder. He was sentenced to six consecutive sentences of 25 years to life. Understandably, the horrific nature of the murders unnerved this quiet Long Island community and the house at 112 Ocean Avenue needed to be sold, but with its traumatic past, not many people were interested in living there. One couple, however, newlyweds George and Kathy Lutz felt differently. They had been searching for a home for themselves and Kathy's three children from her previous marriage. They also had a budget of around 50,000 US dollars. However, they were beginning to despair that they would never find anything suitable when they came across the house priced significantly below market value. Believing that houses do not have memories, they arranged to purchase the house for 80,000 US dollars. This was considerably above their planned budget, but well below what the house was actually worth. On the 17th of December 1975, George, Kathy, the three children and the family dog Harry moved into the house. It was reported that the family also purchased all of the furniture that remained in the house for a small sum. Many of these items were still unmoved from when the police had left the crime scene the year before. From the day that they moved into the property, George and Kathy Lutz felt that something wasn't quite right. No matter how hard they tried, they could not get warm and there were strange cold spots throughout the house. They would hear strange noises and footsteps in the basement. The strange occurrences became more frequent and more intense. Unseen forces would slam windows and rip doors from their hinges. The family were tortured by swarms of insects which attacked them and strange smells permeated through the house. They witnessed glowing red eyes peering into their windows and saw dreadful apparitions. Trickles of slime and liquid seeped through the house. George stated that he saw his wife physically transform into an old woman with grey hair and wrinkles before his eyes. He also reportedly saw his wife levitating towards him. The Lutz family contacted a priest for advice as to what to do about the strange events at the house. The priest suggested that they stay away from the house for a night so that they could get some rest while he investigated what was happening. On January the 14th, 1976, just 28 days after moving into their new home, the Lutz family packed for the night and went to stay at Kathy's mother's house. 
The priest visited their house and was reportedly driven out by a demonic voice as painful blisters erupted on his hands. The Lutz family never returned. Leaving all of their possessions behind, they travelled from Kathy's mother's house to San Diego to start a new life. Soon afterwards, a local TV crew reported on the unusual events at the house and they brought in various so-called ghost hunters and psychics, all of whom agreed that there was a demonic spirit present and that an exorcism was required. During these investigations, the now famous demonic boy photograph was taken despite there being no children present in the house at the time. Some claim that the photograph shows the ghost of John Matthew DeFeo, while others believe it can be explained as either a member of the investigation team or a double exposure photography trick. A book written by Jay Anson with the cooperation of George and Kathy Lutz. The book was called The Amityville Horror, A True Story and was released in 1977. This detailed the paranormal events that the family suffered while living in the house and ultimately led to the 1979 film The Amityville Horror which starred James Brolin and Margot Kidder and also claimed to be based on real events. Despite the family and author Jay Anson maintaining that all of the events detailed in the book were true, many believe that this was based upon nothing more than either overactive imaginations, outright lies or a clever ploy to make money from the previous tragedy which had occurred in the house. Many of the so-called facts within the book relating to timings, weather and physical damage to the property could easily be disproved and many question why the couple never contacted the police during their 28-day ordeal. It has also been claimed that George and Kathy had overextended their finances when purchasing the house and had money troubles from day one. Inspired by the success of the film The Exorcist, the Lutzes, together with William Webber, who was Ronald DeFeo's lawyer, allegedly concocted the story over many bottles of wine. This story was embellished for Jay Anson's book and in turn dramatised further by the filmmakers of the Amityville Horror to the point that this so-called true story bore little to no resemblance of the Lutzes' experience in the house. Years later, questions have remained as to the exact events of the night that the DeFeo family were murdered. Over the years, Ronald has changed his story many times, and in an interview in 1986, he claimed that his sister Dawn had killed the entire family, and then he himself had killed Dawn. Six years later, in 1992, Ronald campaigned for a new trial on the basis that William had pressured him to pursue an insanity defence due to him being more interested in the potential for book and movie contracts than Ronald's defence. Ronald went on to claim that William believed that the insanity defence would make the story more attractive for book or film deals and that he would be able to manipulate these to ensure Ronald's freedom. William, however, denied this, claiming that whilst he was aware of media interest, this did not affect his defence and that Ronald had provided him with at least 15 different versions of the killings. As it was established that a silencer had not been used during the murders, there has also been speculation as to how Ronald had managed to kill six different people on two separate floors without any of them putting up a struggle, particularly as there was no evidence of sedatives being used to subdue his victims. Additionally, none of the neighbours reported hearing gunshots which, with the type of rifle used and the neighbours vicinity to the house, should have been easily audible. Many believe that at least one other person, either Dawn or someone outside of the family, was involved in the shootings but this has never been proved. All of Ronald's appeals and parole applications have been denied and he remains in prison at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York to this day. George and Kathy Lutz maintained that they were telling the truth until their respective deaths in 2006 and 2004. Kathy's son Daniel, who was nine when he lived in the house, also states that the events were true and he believes they were as a result of his stepfather George dabbling in the occult. Kathy's other son Christopher, 
who was seven at the time, also claims that the story was not a hoax and that there were run-ins with the paranormal, but that these have been exaggerated for dramatic effect. The house has changed owners at least five times since the Lutz family moved out and none of the subsequent owners have reported any paranormal activity. It would seem that the biggest problem the homeowners encounter is movie and paranormal fans congregating outside of their home, taking photographs, knocking on the door and trampling through their garden. The extent of the problem has led to one owner changing the address from 112 to 108 Ocean Avenue and another replacing the windows that had been described as evil eyes within the film with regular rectangular windows. Whether Ronald worked alone or had an accomplice in the murder of his family we will likely never know, particularly in view of his ever-changing version of the events of that night. As for the ordeal that the Lutz family claimed that they experienced, whether or not you believe this to be true will largely depend on your thoughts on the paranormal. I would love to hear your views on this in the comments below. As well as the original film in 1979, the film's success led to two cinema sequels, Amityville 2, The Possession, which was in 1982, and Amityville 3D in 1983 and there were also five direct-to-video low-budget sequels released between 1989 and 1996. The Amityville Horror was also remade in 2005, starring Ryan Reynolds and Melissa George. That concludes today's story. Thanks very much to everyone for listening to that. As I mentioned earlier, please leave comments down below, and please also click like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, just a small question today. Would you move into a house that had been a crime scene? Goodbye.